Okay, so so welcome back. Um, and so, so this series of workshops is made possible by a researcher-led initiative funded by the University of Exeter's Research and Development and Research Culture Team. Um, and so this workshop was developed to, to bring together early career researchers across disciplines who believe distance-based options are essential for inclusivity in education, higher education. Um, and our goal, one of our goals was to, to create a network of peers with a shared interest in teaching and developing distance-based courses um, or exploring best practices for accommodating remote students, mentees or colleagues so from both a, a student researcher perspective and a potential um, um, teacher or mentor. Um, and if you want to stay in touch, and Sarah, I think, can put in a link to, to the mentor to the not mentee padlet um, so you can sort of say hi and share your contact de details as you wish um, and there's also a Facebook group a private group that you're welcome to join to stay in touch um, and also a Yammer group which doesn't seem to be very popular but um, if anybody is anti-Facebook there's um, the potential to connect there okay so this afternoon um, I'd, I'd like to, to welcome Professor Sam Hun um, so Sam is an associate professor in anthropology and the program director for anthrozoology um, at the University of Exeter. So Sam's research and teaching cover both social anthropology, so the comparative study of human culture and society, and anthrozoology, um, which is also what I study. I'm a, a, a PhD researcher in anthrozoology, which essentially is a study of human interactions with other animals. Um, so Sam devised, developed and launched the world's first MA and PhD programs in anthrozoology, um, which are both distance based with Exeter and has published widely on a, a wide array of anthropological and anthrozoology topics um, arising from in-depth qualitative research. So her research included field work in um, Swahili lands in South Africa, investigating rhino poaching, primate conservation and human wildlife conflict. And in Europe, namely Romania, looking at street dog welfare, rural Andalusia, Spain and Wales, um, and the UK, focusing on domesticated animals and the care and welfare of animals in agricultural production. So yeah, and the enrollment of um, animals in, uh, in spiritual context, human kingship with dogs. <laughs> Is somebody, can they mute? I seem to be getting feedback. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so more recently, her research has focused on end of care life, uh, end of care for companion animals and childhood experiences following the grief of a companion animal. Um, so, um, sorry, I've totally lost track now. So <laughs> that's quite an impressive bio. Um, but I also want to point out that um, Sam is also my, I'm also fortunate enough to have Sam as my PhD supervisor. I'm a distance-based um, PGR with Exeter. Um, and I also graduated from the MA program um, from Exeter. And um, so this, this wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the, the, fle the flexibility of, um, being able to work while studying and not having to move. Um, and I, I think that this has basically made it possible because even though tuition fees for master's degrees, are, um, they're not insignificant there. They, they, and I'm aware that they can price uh, many potential students out, um, but being able to, to continue working, so not having to quit my job and move um, made it possible. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful to Sam for setting up the MA and because I benefited from it and really enjoyed the program and the, the, yeah, the flexibility of being able to, to study um, remotely. So it's enough waffling there and I'm going to uh, pass on to Sam to, to basically tell you about all the, this, uh, these wonderful courses she's developed and, and, and how we might um, follow suit one day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris, and absolutely no need to apologise for uh, for such a lovely introduction and for also thanks to you and Sarah and Benjamin for setting up this initiative. It's um, it's such an important thing to do and I'm really delighted to be part of it and sorry I haven't been able to attend the other sessions, but I'll look forward to catching up on the, the recordings. So I have prepared um, 
a PowerPoint, so I just have to reacquaint myself with how to upload that. Uh, hold on, bear with me a sec. So it's not a, a formal kind of scripted presentation um, because I was hoping that um, I'd, I'd kind of raise some of the issues and the challenges and the processes that I went through for um, to set up the, the programs that I set up. And then there'll be opportunity for us to, to talk through some of this in, in more detail. Uh, but as Chris said, um, I'm the director of the EASE Working Group, and I also launched the MA and PhD Anthrozoology programs here at Exeter. But I'll talk a little bit about the historical uh, trajectory of the, of the programs, because I initially set the MA program up at my previous uh, academic institution. Um, so just for those of you, I know lots of you are um, either current or former students on the uh, MA Anthrozoology, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it's a purely online distance learning program. Uh, we do have an optional residential module, uh, but obviously uh, with COVID and as a precaution this year, we have been running that as a virtual event, which has still worked pretty well. Um, so I'll talk about the, the rationale for developing the program in a moment, but it's I guess in terms of university uh, university degrees, um, it's aimed at, or it caters for students that would be regarded as non-traditional or atypical, i.e. those who work full-time or have caring responsibilities or have complex uh, learning needs. So lots of our students, as I'll discuss in a bit more detail, um, opt to study via distance learning, um, because for uh, various reasons, they're not able to physically attend a campus-based program. Um, the modes of delivery are, um, and I'll talk a little bit about how these have changed over the years, but uh, the current modes of delivery are predominantly audio lecture podcasts uh, with an accompanying PowerPoint slide. So we do the podcast as audios, um, just because uh, student feedback has suggested that that's how the majority of our students like to consume the podcasts, uh, the, the materials, but we, we are also experimenting with doing some kind of uh, video uh, kind of formats um, as well. And then we have live tutorials where um, students uh, participate. Previously, we used a platform called Adobe Connect, which was incredibly glitchy, but one of the benefits of the pandemic um, is that the the investment in uh, platforms like Teams has made the live tutorial uh, participation and uh, interactive chat discussions much more um, uh, uh, stable. And we also provide links to lots of external multimedia content, um, digitized reading lists, and unique to this particular program, um, as far as I'm aware, is that the students have a dedicated personal tutor who provides over and above the, the kind of standard university quota of uh, personal tutor contact. So I'll talk a bit more about uh, some of the rationale for that and some of the issues that it raises in a moment. Um, so just briefly, these are the things that I'm going to try and uh, get through in the talk. I'll talk a little bit about my background and what motivated me to set up the distance learning program and the anthrozoology distance learning program in particular. I'll talk about some of the market research that I did, um, because as you'll see, when we look at the approval process that's required for an academic program, um, you have to really demonstrate that there's a market for this particular program. We'll explore some of the challenges that I encountered, but that are also inherent to uh, the development or delivery of distance learning programs. We'll touch on the importance of recognizing distance learning, distance learners as a community of individuals, but particularly a community of non-traditional individuals from a university perspective. Because when we, when I, when I discuss the challenges in more detail, that um, trying to um, communicate to the university that distance learners, the differences between um, distance learners as a as a community and the the kind of the campus-based students that are more more kind of the bread and butter of the university has, has been a real, real kind of challenge. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the learning support needs of distance learners, um, the evolution of distance learning provision, 
Um, and then I'll go into more detail about the approval process, which will obviously vary from one institution to the next, but I'll use the approval process for Exeter as a kind of case study. Talk a little bit about recruitment um, and also accessibility and inclusivity. Um, when I, as you'll see, when I set up the MA, one of my main motivations was to make it as accessible as possible. And the market research that I conducted suggested that the kind of students that I was, um, I was wanting to, to create the program for wouldn't necessarily be able to, to kind of up and leave and join a campus-based program. But the distance learning nature of the program and the other needs that distance learners present with um, means that we often have to, to kind of think outside the box in terms of how to ensure accessibility and inclusivity. And I'm conscious that some of the other speakers like Michelle have talked uh, more about this in relation to specific um, maybe learning needs. Um, and then I'll just uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the strategies that I've used to try and engage distance learners and um, and then very briefly talk about the, the PhD programme, which was a, a kind of a late addition or a more recent development, um, but within the context of trying to ensure um, professional development um, and a kind of path to employability. So um, just a bit then about my background for those of you who don't know me. Um, I. I, I, I worked in marketing for quite a long time before uh, returning to university to do a PhD at UCL. Um, and during my doctoral field work, um, which was focused on human animal interactions in a rural Welsh farming community, I became very aware of the, the, the kind of growth of interest in academic uh, research on human animal interaction. So at the time that I did, I started my field work, um, it, was, it was very much an emerging, emerging uh, kind of area of expertise. I was told by my supervisors at UCL that um, I, if I was an anthropologist, as I, as I was, um, I needed to focus on the human aspects of these interactions. And it was during the course of my PhD that the, the kind of the field started shifting to, to a much more holistic and balanced way of approaching um, these kind of multi-species interactions. But during the course of my research, I did a lot of hands-on um, work on farms and helping uh, train and look after horses. And I suffered a really, well, several quite significant uh, physical injuries. Um, and one of the most serious where I was um, hospitalized for quite a long period of time and had a, a severe brain uh, kind of head injury coincided with um, the start of a teaching contract at UCL. So I was living in Wales, recovering in Wales, and I was expected to commute to London once a week to deliver in-person teaching. And this became hugely uh, traumatic for me. It was it was a real ordeal to have to um, to kind of navigate public transport um, when I was on crutches and when I'd had um, trying to to deal with the the quite serious um, after effects of a of a head injury. Um, so not only did I have kind of really disabling migraines, but also experienced um, kind of executive cognitive dysfunction where. Um, because of the, the trauma to my, to my brain, I would sometimes find myself in a kind of rabbit in headlights type situation. Um, and that made in-person kind of face-to-face -face live teaching quite, uh, quite stressful. Um, and coincidentally, or I guess fortunately, I was offered um, uh, some teaching at the University of Wales Lampeter at around the same time. And a large proportion of their postgraduate portfolio was delivered through the medium of distance learning. And it was as a result of my, my kind of physical difficulties uh, with accessing the, 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 the campus in London, combined with the, the kind of cognitive issues that I was having as my brain was recovering from this quite traumatic head injury, that really um, made me acutely aware of the, the benefits of uh, being able to prepare teaching materials to be delivered to distance learners. I wasn't kind of put, in, put on the spot. I wasn't having to, to kind of think on my feet, um, which at that particular time was, was virtually impossible. 
And so I was really excited to be able to, to kind of continue with my teaching, but to do it in a, in a virtual setting. So at the time I started working at Lampeter, they had a portfolio of online master's programs and an online anthropology undergraduate degree. Um, and the master's programs were all quite niche. One was in death studies, one was in cultural astronomy and astrology, one was in environmental anthropology, and then a, a more kind of conventional MA in social anthropology. Um, and these programs were delivered, this was, um, this was back in, I think, kind of the two, 2003, I started working at the University of Wales Lampeter, and um, distance learning was very much in its infancy. The OU had been going for, for quite some time, um, but for Lampeter, the way that the distance learning was delivered was um, the, the reading materials and the lecture materials were all collated into kind of a handbook. And then they, along with interactive recordings on CD-ROM, would be posted out to students. So it was very much like a correspondence course. Um, but while I was uh, while I was kind of supporting students through their, their studies, oh, I can see there's some comments in the chat. Okay. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at multitasking. Um, so I'll come back to the chat um, at the end. So Chris or Sarah or Benjamin, if there's anything that I need to, to stop to address in the chat as I'm going, please just let me know. Um, and yeah, as Linda said, they also uh, offered uh, other distance learning programs such as uh, an MA in nature as well. Um, but it was while doing this that um, I started to have the, the kind of the seed of an idea of developing uh, a module at that time on human animal interactions. And that proved really popular with students on the social and environmental anthropology master's programs. And as a result of that, um, feed, it was actually feedback from a, an end of module evaluation form where a student said, oh, this really could have been an entire program that the kind of the penny dropped. And I thought actually this would be a really uh, exciting thing to pursue. So it was quite serendipitous really. I didn't set out to develop distance learning programs of my own. Um, I've been very happy teaching on existing distance learning programs, but through my experience of teaching on those existing programs, I also felt that there was more that could be done in terms of the way that distance learning was provided. Um, so it felt that the students were experiencing quite a, a flat uh, educational experience, just being sent materials through the post that they had to work through at their own pace. And then we did have kind of live discussions or chats through um, Microsoft Messenger at the time, but um, it was very limited. So when I um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of moving the program to Exeter and and what that enabled me to do in terms of developing the, the program and the way it was delivered in a moment. But I just wanted to touch on um, the importance of or the process of researching the market, because any any new program within an academic institution requires quite a considerable amount of due diligence to be conducted. And um, while I was really fortunate at Lampeter that they already were on board with the, the kind of the mode of delivery and they had this portfolio of distance learning courses that I could slot into, because anthrozoology was such a niche area, um, I had to do quite a lot of work to demonstrate to the university that there was a market for this particular program. So obviously I had the, the kind of module feedback to show that um, at least the students on the on that particular module thought that there was a demand for it. Um, I also had to reach out to established organizations. So ISAS, which is the International Society of Anthrozoology and the Animals and Society Institute, all um, were very helpful in terms of providing background information about um, about the field, um, the history of the field, showing that it was a, a kind of an emergent um, a growing in popularity. And the Animals and Society Institute also has a, a really nice database of programs and modules of, that are offered at, at academic institutions around the world. Now, at the time, back in 2007, when I launched, um, or when I was doing the market research for the Anthrozoology program, which then launched in 2008, there weren't any other Anthrozoology master's programs. Um, but there were, I was able to kind of trawl the ASI database to find existing modules, for example, 
uh, models on, uh, I remember one called Man and Beast, Man and, Men and Beasts or something that was run by the University of Southampton's archaeology department and, and kind of co collating a, 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 a kind of a database of all these existing modules to show that there was there was interest, um, but it was still quite speculative as to whether there would be a demand, sufficient demand to make a pro program, an entire program on anthropology sustainable. I also had to do a lot of literature based research um, to show that um, the number of publications in on academic publications in this field were um, were increasing. And I also did some. Uh, so at the time when I was working in Lambda, they had a very a kind of small marketing department and um, and so quite a lot of uh, responsibility was put on academics to do the market research to to demonstrate that there was a, a viable market for the program. So I did some focus groups with um, the existing students at the university. Um, and I also reached out um, attending conferences, for example, the British Equine Veterinary Association Conference. Um, I went to uh, kind of animal related trade fairs and so on to, to try and ascertain whether there would be a neat interest beyond academia, really, for, for students to potentially come in and take the, the program as, as part of their professional development. And I had various conversations with the Royal Veterinary College um, and was kind of one of the, the key, I guess, factors that led to the university agreeing to have an anthrozoology program added to their books was that um, vets and vet nurses are required to do CPD annually. What I didn't realize at the time and that didn't get factored into the, the market research was that they have to do courses that are, that are accredited by the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons for it to count for their CPD. But, um, but the fact that there was this requirement for people who worked with animals in different professional contexts to do CPD um, was, was, was kind of enough to show that there could be wider interest beyond the, the kind of the conventional students that the university was used to recruiting. Um, so I moved the master's program from Lampeter to Exeter in 2012, and that enabled me to, to kind of really revolutionize the way that we were delivering the content. So as I said, at Lampeter, the, 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 the mode of delivery was pretty flat, um, but Exeter obviously uses Moodle, the LE platform. And so I was able to, um, to for the first time, have a really interactive, um, platform to uh, engage with the students. When it comes to um, setting up new programs, um, as I said, you, there's a lot of due diligence that has to be done, and I'll talk through the, the process in a moment. Um, but one of the things that made the migration from Lampeter to Exeter um, much more straightforward was that I already had an existing cohort of students on the program at Lampeter. Um, and because I was the only person at Lampeter who taught anthrozoology and who specialised in anthrozoology, the university fortunately agreed that um, they would close the programme and I could, I could bring it with me to Exeter. So I guess that's one, I will we'll come on to talk about this in a bit more detail, but having a, having a strategy for how to recruit students for um, having a clear sense of the market or, or doing a lot of research to try and establish the market is, is really key for, for getting something approved by, a, by an academic institution. So this is, um, you should all be able to access this. I, I'm pretty certain it's, it's open. It's, it's not one that you need a password or anything to access, but there's a link here to the university's uh, quality and standards, uh, the TQAE, um, which outlines the, the kind of flowchart process for getting a program, a new program approved within an academic inst institution. And as I said, this will vary from one institution to the next, but I'm just using the Exeter um, flowchart and uh, process as a, as a kind of an illustrative example. And it's not that much different to the, the process that I had to go through at Lampeter. So there are essentially two stages. Um, the first is the business approval, and then the second is the academic approval. So the business approval stage, <clears throat> and I've, as I said, I've put the link to the, the relevant uh, TQA page where you'll find all of the forms and all of the guidelines and so on. 
But the business approval stage is basically um, required to satisfy the university that there is a market for the program and um, that the, uh, oh, sorry, there's quite a lot of feedback. I don't know if someone's, someone's got a mic on if you wouldn't mind muting. Um, yeah, to, to satisfy the university that there's a market and that the program can be delivered um, sustainably. Um, then the second part of the process is um, the uh, academic um, approval uh, stage. Those of you who've, um, well, those of you who've uh, submitted uh, kind of uh, book manuscript uh, proposals to publishers, it's a very similar process that you have to uh, fill out quite a complex form. You have to provide rationale for the, um, the introduction of this new program to show that there is not just a market for it um, and that to, to satisfy the university that they'll be, you know, it will, it will um, be economically viable, but also so to, to demonstrate that it's academically viable. So for me, when I set <clears throat> the anthrozoology program up initially, as I said, it was a, a, a very new discipline. Um, there weren't any other programs dedicated to anthrozoology. And so I had to do a lot of additional work to try and demonstrate the, the, that there was this, this growing academic interest in the field. But not just that there's interest, but showing that the program will be able to make valuable academic contributions. So in terms of the anthrozoology program, um, teaching students um, in a range of methods, um, in introducing them to a wide range of theoretical debates and um, academic bodies of literature. Um, <clears throat> then um, the other aspects are um, kind of market analysis. Um, so not in terms of establishing that there would be people who'd want to join the program, but assessing what um, exists already out there. And as I said, when I set the, uh, the MA up, there, there weren't any other anthrozoology programs. But if I were to be going through this process now, there are uh, quite a significant number of programs, um, either specifically focused on anthrozoology, or that are, are kind of related to or, or speak to the, the core concerns of anthrozoology. Um, <clears throat> And uh, another, another really important aspect from a university's perspective is that the students, and, and I guess particularly when it's a non-traditional academic subject like anthrozoology, is to demonstrate that the students will acquire valuable transferable skills that will enable them to, to be employable or more employable after they've completed the course. And again, when I first set the program up, that was all quite speculative. Um, although, as I said, I did do lots of market research with professional organizations like the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. Um, but I'm very fortunate now that we've got a, a really strong track record of we've, we've got nearly 200 students who've graduated from the program now. And uh, we, we've got, in many cases, a really clear indication of the impact of the MA on their employability. And so I'll talk about a couple of examples later on in the, the presentation. So another significant aspect um, that universities uh, require um, kind of information on in order to, to approve a new program or, or a new module is in, in terms of the resources required. So when I brought the MA program to Exeter, I was delivering it all single handedly. So um, given I was bringing a large number of students with me, that was quite a cost effective um, uh, proposition for the university. But in many situations, if you're setting up a new program, particularly if it's um, if it's uh, it's perhaps kind of dive or kind of yeah, it's not directly related to the the core business of the the university, then perhaps arguments will be need to make, be made for additional staff to be brought on board, and and that also is quite a, a lengthy process. Um, and then finally, the, the need to put together a really detailed program description, so um, uh, syllabus, module uh, descriptors and uh, reading lists and, uh, and, and all of this kind of information. So 
I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. I'm happy to talk through any aspect of it in the in the Q and A, but um, it's it's all quite self explanatory, and the the link there does provide you with all of the forms and the guidance. Um, and as I say, it's it's kind of it's an open access link, so you can have a look in your own time. Ah, sorry, I missed a slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about challenges, which I've I've alluded to some of them. Um, but I think it's really important to be aware of it because it's not it's not a straightforward process to get a, a new program set up and particularly not if it's distance learning within uh, an HE context where distance learning is is kind of peripheral to the, the core business of the institution. So if you're perhaps going to be pitching a, a distance learning module to the open university, then you might experience fewer challenges than if you're um, based within a kind of traditional bricks and mortar institution and wanting to try and uh, try and propose a new module or a new program that's purely distance learning. So as I said earlier, um, being able to establish demand is important regardless of whether it's a distance learning or a campus based program and ensuring that you've got a, a clear way of reaching your target students um, is, is a, quite a significant challenge. So as I said, when I set up the anthrozoology program, I wasn't really sure how I'd go about reaching the kinds of people who I thought might be interested in it. And so I took a real scattergun approach. Um, I kind of did mailings, email, uh, uh, emails to different professional organizations, um, to FE colleges who offered uh, kind of animal management courses. Um, to the, I did lots of marketing with uh, anthropological organizations because of my professional background being in anthropology, the anthrozoology program was very much rooted in anthropology. And so it's perhaps no surprise that a lot of our students, a high percentage of our students who come to the program come with an anthropology or social sciences background. Um, Another significant challenge is, and maybe conflict's too strong a word to use, but I guess I have experienced conflict um, in terms of the, the way that uh, university, uh, universities perceive uh, the, what's required to deliver um, a, a program of education. Um, so for example, um, with a distance learning program, the the, the contact hours, the, the live tutorials tend not to be timetabled centrally because we don't require use of the, the physical lecture halls, but also because a lot of our students are living in different time zones. So it just it it it's it's just not it doesn't make sense for these sessions to be centrally timetabled. <clears throat> And that can lead to uh, to kind of issues with um, in terms of workload with staff uh, who are delivering the modules also needing to engage in some of the, the admin around timetabling. Um, so in terms of infrastructure, then um, I think, again, that's another way in which there is the potential for conflict to be a challenge. And certainly when I set the anthrozoology program up at Lampeter, um, there was an existing infrastructure, but it was very limited. As I said, it was just the kind of printed materials, um, very uh, one dimensional uh, CD ROMs that people had to work through in their own time. And one of the benefits of the pandemic has been that um, most academic institutions, if not all now have the infrastructure in place to be able to support uh, virtual participation in, um, in, in higher education. So hopefully infrastructure will be less of a challenge for any of you who are looking to, to set up distance learning uh, modules or programs at your respective institutions in the future. But it is something to, to, to be aware of. Um, <clears throat> challenges can also arise in relation to workload. Um, certainly, I think a lot of uh, colleagues within uh, the department here at Exeter where I'm based found during the, the, the lockdowns when everything was having to shift into virtual uh, formats that it creates a, a lot of extra workload that isn't um, 
that isn't usually uh, associated with the kind of traditional modes of HE delivery. Um, and so that's perhaps something that also needs to be considered when you're filling out the, the documentation together program or a module approved um, in terms of the resources that are required for, uh, for getting this off the ground. And that's also related to uh, sustainability. As I said, when I um, brought the program to Exeter, I was the only person teaching the entire program, and that's not sustainable. So making sure that there are, uh, that wherever you're planning to, to kind of set up your module or your program, um, thinking about what would happen if, uh, if you were to, to be incapacitated for whatever reason, how would the program be able to continue in your absence? What other resources do you need to, to make sure that the program can function? Um, how many students would the program need to recruit in order to cover the costs associated with running it? So these are all the, the kind of considerations that have to go into the, the program approval process. And then another really important challenge, which I'll just touch on because I'm sure it's something you've all discussed in some of the other sessions, um, is in terms of the, the, the profiles, needs and expectations of the, the kinds of students who are perhaps more drawn to distance learning than campus-based uh, modes of delivery. Um, as I said earlier, lots of our students, um, uh, well, maybe I'll talk about it more in, in, in the next slide, um, and along with perceptions. So I'll so this was a piece of research that came out quite recently uh, focused on the University of Botswana's distance learning provision, um, which outlined some of the challenges that were faced by staff who wanted to deliver distance learning at that particular institution. And um, one of the, the key challenges was, um, and I've highlighted it here, the stigma emanating from a general belief that higher education provision through distance learning is inferior to face to face provision. So I'd say this is perhaps one of the most significant challenges that I faced, um, I've faced over the years of, of kind of being an advocate for, for distance learning. That um, for various reasons, and I guess we can talk about this more in the, the Q&A, um, there is this, this kind of very strong emphasis on the importance of face-to-face, in-person interaction when it comes to, uh, to, to learning. And I think this is maybe something that's that's increasingly being challenged, the more that research that's done on kind of student uh, engagement with distance learning, especially in the wake of the pandemic when so many students um, who wouldn't have necessarily chosen to engage virtually um, have had to. I mean, obviously it's it's far from perfect, but I think that, um, that there's, there's a huge amount to be gained from distance learning that perhaps often uh, overlooked or has certainly been overlooked in the past pre-pandemic. And in relation to my own particular area of um, academic specialism, anthrozoology or human-animal relations, um, I've certainly found one of the challenges that Wilkie outlines in her, her article around um, the academic study of human-animal relations, that when there is a, a, a when, when a perhaps when a program or a module focuses on a, a non-traditional or a, a, a perhaps a more niche area of um, specialism, that there's, there's the risk of that also being stigmatized. And so Wilkie talks about uh, animal studies in particular as being academic dirty work, that it's, um, it makes people feel uncomfortable um, and for a whole host of reasons. Um, so I wanted to just touch on briefly the, the community of distance learners and why, uh, why I think it's so important that um, distance learning modules and programs are available, um, because so many of the students who've come through the, the, the programs that I set up, and I know lots of you, several of you are here, um, would not have been able to, uh, to have acquired their, their postgraduate qualifications had the the program not been online and I know that's Chris acknowledged that in her in her introduction. Um, so lots of our students um, have chosen to study remotely, um, some have uh, established careers that they don't want to or can't afford to kind of put on hold for uh, the time that it would take them to, to move and physically attend a, a program to, to complete a campus-based degree. 
for some costs are an issue and Chris again rightly pointed out that the fees are, are high whether you're campus based or distance learning but if you're able to to maintain your um, your career then that can help mitigate costs or can potentially in, so, in many cases make it easier to, to get loans and to make the repayments on those loans. Lots of our students um, opted to, to study via distance because of family uh, not wanting to or not being able to relocate because of family um, child care or elder care or you know other members of their family uh, requiring their their support and care um, but also caring responsibilities um, relate beyond the the human and certainly for an anthrozoology program a large number of our students have caring responsibilities for other animals which again would make it impossible for them to, to kind of just up sticks and relocate. And a huge number, I'd say over half of our stu the students on the programme opted to study remotely via distance learning because of disabilities, either physical and or um, psychological that made physical attendance on campus um, either difficult or impossible. So, uh, okay, so I was going to just cover a few examples of these, but I'm conscious of time. Uh, I mean, lots of our students, as I said, have caring responsibilities. We've had others like Katie here um, uh, who, who had a really successful dog training business and didn't want to, to kind of just leave that. And um, as a result of her you know, learning about anthrozoology, then went on to have a successful kind of TV career. But other students who work um, who have really established careers as zookeepers with really close bonds with the animals who they care for We've got other students based internationally um, so picture in the bottom right um, one of our former students who runs a, a, an animal welfare ngo in thailand and um and so for for all of these students um the it just wouldn't be possible to to just kind of put their lives on hold and come and physically attend a campus-based program. There are also many other benefits that students have fed back over the, the however many years it is that I've been running the program now, um, including uh, you know, the flexibility that it enables them to, to fit it in with other, other, other aspects of their lives. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna pause a sec. Chris, I'm conscious of time. I think I may have misunderstood. Am I supposed to speak for 50 minutes or is that all of the time? Sorry. Um, we, we actually have a slot after a coffee break. So if, if people are able to stick around, we can, I'm sure there'll be questions. So yeah, I'm just, just um, carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Super. Thank you. Um, yeah. So in 2019, we did uh, quite a large survey of the stu current students at that time as, and it went out to all of our alumni as well. Um, and one of the things that we were interested in finding out was what had motivated them to study uh, the MA in the first place. And uh, I haven't got the, the actual figures in front of me. I just wanted to pull out some quotes to illustrate this, but a, a very large number of them um, emphasized the, the distance learning nature as being key to their, the, the, being one of the key motivators for them. Um, so another really um, important thing to keep in mind when setting up either a program or a module for distance learners is the importance of accessibility and inclusivity. And as I said, <coughs> excuse me, at the outset, my own kind of disability was one of the reasons that motivated me to, to set up the program as, as purely distance learning. Um, but over the course of the years and after meeting and working with and trying to support students with a very diverse range of needs, um, it, it's become glaringly apparent that um, distance learning is not a panacea and in many cases can raise uh, as many if not more issues than it, than it solves. So the need for flexibility and to try and kind of troubleshoot a, a lot of these potential issues when you're putting together the proposal for establishing a, a distance learning program is, is going to be really important. So as I said, over half of our students have ILPs or individual learning plans and that speak to a diverse range of, of, of needs and disabilities. 
and trying to ensure that we can accommodate all of those within with the limitations imposed by the technology that um, and the, the other kind of resources that are available within the institution is, is, a, is, a, is, is something that has to be con continuously navigated. Also uh, tr trying to ensure that people are accommodated who are in different time zones. Um, just because uh, people don't have to move from where they or relocate um, doesn't necessarily level the playing field. Um, we've had students in the past living in remote areas in Africa where connectivity has been an issue. And so they've been disadvantaged because they've not been able to, to reliably participate in the interactive aspects of the programme. Isolation is also a really significant issue, which I'm sure is something we've already discussed, but I think can't be emphasized enough that distance learning uh, really, uh, people who provide distance learning provision, uh, uh, teaching really need to, to kind of go out of their way to ensure that there's a sense of community amongst students. And that's, that can be really challenging. And again, one of the, the benefits to come out of the pandemic is the, 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 the much um, greater awareness of uh, and use of different kind of ways of connecting um, across the institution to, to bring people together and virtually. Um, another really important consideration when it comes to distance learning, and I don't know if this is the case across the board with distance learning, but has certainly been a really key aspect of my own experience with this particular program, is that with the non-traditional student body comes um, often additional needs for flexibility, because where you have people juggling caring responsibilities, um, juggling childcare, juggling health issues, juggling uh, paid employment, um, they are not always able to meet deadlines in the way that we might expect uh, campus-based kind of undergraduates who are just kind of, uh, who are perhaps uh, you know, just have themselves to, to, to look out for and are just working kind of part-time jobs to, to, to pay for their maintenance. So again, when it comes to preparing the approval documentation or trying to make a rationale for, um, for the establishment of a distance learning program, recognizing the need for flexibility in dist amongst distance learners can also have quite a significant impact on university professional services and administrators who then um, need to kind of make, uh, you know, provide extensions and uh, support students with mitigating circumstances and so on. And certainly one of the ways I've tried to, uh, to kind of deal with that on this particular program is through the provision of uh, program specific additional support for our students. Um, and we're very fortunate to have a dedicated personal tutor who um, is on hand to speak with and support our students. Um, and, and so as, as most of you know, that's Fenella and she's also a graduate of the program herself. So is very um, aware of the content and is able to advise students, not just on the, their pastoral issues, but also um, help them if they're struggling with any particular academic issues too. <coughs> and, uh, and also, I guess her main role is to sign post students to other support that's provided through the university. But having that, that kind of anchor really has been essential for distance learners. And I think, again, that's something that's come to the fore as a result of the pandemic, the need for that, um, that regular um, supportive contact from the institution when students aren't physically based on site. So um, I mentioned earlier the importance of recruitment um, and demonstrating that there's a demand, and I just wanted to briefly uh, relay some of the ways that I've gone about trying to recruit students uh, because obviously that will be something that will vary depending on the type of program or the type of module that you're wanting to set up. Um, one of the, the things that's been most powerful I think for our program is word of mouth. We have, again I don't know the exact figures, but we have quite a high proportion of students who join the program because a colleague or a friend um, has taken the program previously. And I think that's reflected in the, the, the kind of the trajectory of, of, of numbers on the program. So when the first year that the program ran in Lampeter, there were six students on it. 
and I think um, this year we, we had uh, 48 students join the programme. So there's been a, a steady increase in the number of students, partly through word of mouth, um, but also through staff and students associated with the programme disseminating their research uh, in publications or at conferences, also through building affiliations with relevant external organisations and stakeholders. So lots of our students um, have their fees paid for by their employers. Um, and so, for example, pretty much every year we'll have students from the RSPCA. Uh, we have uh, yeah, students from lots of different organisations where we've had either students come before or where we've built collaborative relationships. So one of my recent research projects was conducted in collaboration with the Blue Cross and several of our current students are also work for or volunteer for the Blue Cross. Um, social media has also been um, really key and certainly when I set the program up originally kind of pre-social media then using kind of keywords and having make, making sure that search engines picked up on um, on the program when someone searched for anthrozoology or human animal relations um, was, was really important. So these are all things to think about if you are wanting to set up a program where there isn't any kind of uh, uh, precedent, maybe you want to set up a, an anthrozoology program at the institution where, where you work. Um, and I know several of my former graduates have gone on to do that. Um, then just just it's another thing to be aware of how are you going to recruit students to it's, it's all very well establishing there's a need establishing there's demand, but then you also need to, to kind of reach those students too. Um, and then. I guess going back to one of the points that I made earlier, um, the importance of trying to, to create a sense of community amongst distance learners and, and I think it's something I've it's probably one of my weaknesses because I'm not very active on social media but very fortunate that so many of our wonderful students are so um, you know Chris and Sarah and um, so many of the the current cohort very active on social media as are a lot of our alumni and so it's really great that um, that that's a really good way of creating a sense of community amongst uh, amongst the cohort. We also um, have various uh, kind of uh, initiatives that we've run or that we are running as part of the program team, responding to student requests or student concerns. So this year, one of or a couple of the students on the Applied Anthrozoology module, which is a, a module where students do a kind of practical project. Um, we're finding that it was quite challenging for them emotionally and um, and so they asked for additional support and we set up um, a, a dedicated Teams channel called Affective Anthrozoology, which then fed into the development of um, a regular online uh, kind of uh, cafe style uh, event where students could come together and discuss the emotional impacts of doing the kind of research that they were doing, which if they were on campus, they'd be able to do over a a cup of coffee in, in, in person, but they don't have that option as distance learners. So having that space where uh, that uh, and that dedicated space where people can come together and share experiences, even if they don't make use of it to know that it's there, I think is, is really important. And then finally, um, the, the, um, the importance, uh, and this is something that has to go into the the, the kind of program approval documentation is showing that there is um, transfer there are transferable skills that students who do the whatever program it is that you're setting up or whatever module um, will acquire transferable skills but also that it will enable them to to progress and become more employable than they would have been had they not done the program and so lots of our students who've done the MA and all the PhD program have gone on to 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 have really, um, uh, really very uh, directly related uh, careers, uh, career changes as a result of this. So Kate, uh, one particular example, who did the MA and the PhD and is now the strategic communications manager at WWF, which is one of the biggest um, animal related NGOs in the world. Um, 
And I've given another example here of Sharon, who would not have been able to have done her PhD had it not been distance learning because she she conducted the PhD while she was based in um, in Benin in West Africa, where she works for a, for an NGO. So um, I think it was because of the, the recognizing that the MA was almost like just the, the 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 tip of the iceberg, really, for a lot of our students. It kind of gave them a a taste of, of what, what was possible that I then decided to try and get a PhD program established. And it was much easier to get the PhD program established off the back of the masters because there was a clear kind of route to market. There was, um, there was, there had been clear expressions of interest from students who were on the MA or who, who had recently graduated from the MA. Um, so I think, um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about setting up the PhD program in the Q&A, but um, I'm just kind of touching on it briefly, uh, just as a, as a kind of next step, if you like, um, after having set the MA up and, and seen the, the kind of work that the students did and the, the things that they wanted to, to do um, as, as an important kind of continuation. So I think that's everything. Um, I'm sorry that, that that probably went on a bit longer than, than it should have, but I'm really happy to also answer any questions over email if people aren't able to stay, uh, stay now. Okay, super. Thank you.